video section, we're not just going to talk about our auditory sense, we're going to talk about some other senses that are embedded in our ear structure as well when we get to the inner ear. We're going to start off with the outer ear, then the middle ear, then the inner ear, talking about uh, different, different components. So let's get to it. So the outer ear is really what we're talking about is the part that we come in contact with on a regular basis. Uh, and that includes our pinna. So the pinna is really the funnel shaped uh, collection of cartilage on the outside of our skull that's really used to collect sound waves. And so everybody's piercing their pinnas and, and doing lots of uh, nice body uh, art to their ears. Um, and that's, that's really the part that helps us to catch the sound waves. Once our pinna catches the sound waves, it moves into our auditory canal and then to our drum. And so our eardrum is really um, the furthest part in, in the outer ear. And so as the sound waves go in, they hit the eardrum and this makes the eardrum vibrate. That's, that's really all there is to the outer ear. Then we move to the inner ear. So after the eardrum vibrates, it sets into the motion a domino effect with the three auditory ossicles. And so the auditory ossicles are small little bones, often called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, but also but it could be called the malus, incus, and stapes, respectively. And so they're named based on their shapes. And so it's the idea that the hammer or malus will vibrate, which will cause a domino effect in the incus or anvil, which will cause a domino effect in the stirrup or stapes. And so it's important to understand that these are considered separate from the outer ear um, and that if somebody has an inner ear or a middle ear infection or what have you, it means something different than an outer ear infection. And then we move to the inner ear and the inner ear looks like something outside of this world really. Uh, and so after the stirrup, uh, it basically connects to the cochlea. And so the cochlea looks a bit like a snail shell. Uh, it's not quite a Fibonacci swirl. The cochlea is a little coiled organ in the inside of her ear. And inside the cochlea uh, is the bacillar membrane that's filled with lots of little hair cells. Uh, and then the back of the cochlea is connected to our auditory nerve. So we're gonna zoom in and talk about this cochlea a little bit more in detail. So within the cochlea, uh, we have lots of little hair cells, and the hair cells look different from rods and cones and from neurons we saw in Unit 3. Uh, the hair cells actually have, uh, they look like little vases, if you will, little rods sticking out of them, and the little hairs vibrate. And so when the sound waves make it to the cochlea, the hairs vibrate. Uh, and there was two theories about how these hairs work. There was the frequency theory and the place theory. Frequency theory was the idea that at a high frequency noise, where it had a shorter wavelength, high frequency, the frequency with which the hairs wiggled would be faster. And at a low frequency noise, the frequency at which the hairs wiggled would be slower. And that this would be interpreted in our brain as a high pitch versus low pitch noise. Place theory is the idea that the hairs along the cochlea are more sensitive to different pitches than others. It's the idea that as sound enters the base of the cochlea, uh, we can hear the most high-pitched things at 20,000 hertz, and, but those high-frequency things quickly die out, and only the low-pitched noises make it to the inner part of the cochlea, where we'll be more sensitive to 200 or 20 or hertz even. Uh, and so this is the idea um, that different hairs in different places uh, will be more sensitive to different sounds which is correct, frequency or place, uh, much like with our trichromatic and opponent processing theories in vision, both of these theories have merit. We actually now find that it's, it's a bit of a hybrid of both. We definitely find that different parts of the cochlea are sensitive to different frequencies. We also find that the speed at which these hairs wiggle does depend on the frequency of sound. Uh, so th this is a really good thing to note. It also helps us to understand why we may lose sensitivity to some types of frequencies at different points in our lifespan, particularly the higher frequencies early on. And that's because if you think all sound must travel by the base of the cochlea, the hairs at the very entrance are going to get worn out for the hairs at the base. And so low frequency sounds are going to become more resilient uh, than high frequency sounds, which might may be why in older ages, we become less sensitive to those high pitched noises. Also going on in this inner ear uh, is loss of other sensory systems. So here we have a drawing of the inner ear with the cochlea illustrated, but then also the vestibule, the saccule, the utricle, and the oval windows. And these become essential to another sensory system called the vestibular sense. And so the vestibular sense is really our sense of balance. 
So we're going to jump into it. It's pretty basic for this course, but it's the idea that the oval windows are these fluid filled organs and they also have hair cells. The hair cells look a little bit different in here as compared to in our cochlea, but these hair cells vibrate as the fluid moves around. And this helps us to get a sense of balance, whether we're sitting, lying, standing, uh, what have you. And there's a second nerve. In addition to the auditory nerve that's connected to the back of the cochlea, there's also a vestibular nerve that takes the vestibular information and brings it to our brain. So it's a completely sensory, a separate sensory system, separate from our auditory system, has its own intake, own cells, own, and its own nervous pathway, uh, but it's also located in the inner ear. Then the vestibular sense system can also help us to interpret and make sense of our proprioceptive center. So the proprioceptive sense is the perception of your body position. So vestibular is the idea you can balance while you're sitting up or standing, but proprioceptive is the idea that you know if you're sitting or standing. This is the idea if you wake up from a dream and you haven't opened your eyes yet, do you know which way you're laying? Are you on your back? Are you on your side? Are you on your stomach? Um, are you hanging off the bed? It's the idea that by closing your eyes, you know where your body is. So the proprioceptive center gets information from both the vestibular system and gets nervous information from our spinal cord, specifically from um, our motor neurons in our muscles, tendons, joints, and skin to get a sensation of our body position. And then finally in this section, we're going to talk about the kinesthesia sense. And so this gets information from the vestibular and the proprioceptive systems in addition to new information from our muscles, joints, and tendons. And it's not just if we're balanced or what position we're in, but the sense of our body moving. And so this is the idea that our body can move through space. And so it's the idea that when you are walking, the sensation that you're actually walking and not standing still or the sensation when you're swimming that you're actually moving through the water. Now, sometimes this can be, uh, uh, there can certainly be illusions of our kinesthetic sense. If you're on a moving sidewalk and then it stops, or um, if you're on a train and you think your train has started, but it's actually the train beside you that started, you can uh, trick your kinesthetic sense as well. Uh, so this is a separate sense from your vestibular and your proprioceptive and your auditory sense, and all four of them get information from your ear.